All right. Uh, welcome to uh, our distinguished uh, lecture series, which is sponsored by uh, RTI's fellows programs. And uh, as you know, our distinguished lecture series is focused on uh, science and society. And today is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Macy, who is a um, Goldman Smith uh, Professor of Arts and Sciences in the departments of information science and sociology at Cornell. He is also the director of a social dynamics lab. And uh, he has been doing um, social science and online uh, data analysis and methodology uh, since I think online data existed. And so he will be presenting today his visionary view of digital footprints and future of social science. So please welcome. Well, thank you very much, uh, Georgi. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, be here today, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's wonderful to have the opportunity to share with you um, some of the abilities of research um, in social science that are made possible by access to digital data. Are you getting the echo? Is it okay? Um, the backdrop is that social life is to observe uh, for a number of reasons, including social um, and ethical and, and practical uh, limitations on, uh, on the use of experiments, um, but also because social life is uh, often in the form of interactions that are fleeting, uh, they're in private, and the number of these interactions increases exponentially with the size of the population. But social life is not the only thing that's hard to see. It's hard to see distant galaxies and subatomic particles and viruses and what goes on in the brain when we're thinking. And new technologies uh, have addressed these challenges. Telescopes, um, uh, MRI, colliders, electron microscopes have had enormous formative impact across the natural and life sciences. And the good news for scientists, as Duncan Watts finally have our telescope, um, the web. And um, almost everything that we do now is digitally recorded. And in many cases, uh, these data are publicly available, or they can be uh, shared with researchers. And a lot of people refer to this as big data. I'm sure all have heard that term. I don't like to use that term because transformative about these data is size. It's, it's what these data can allow us to measure and to observe that we couldn't see before. Uh, we can observe individual level behavior in real time uh, and across cultures. Um, we can travel through time, back through time, to study the, the origins of a community in its early stages of formation. We can track diffusion not only of the things that go viral, but of the things that fail to spread. Uh, and we can run online experiments with much larger and more diverse uh, participant pools than was uh, possible in the era of physical labs. So the main point that I'd like to leave with you today is that the transformative impact of online data is it's not just empirical. It's theoretical. And the theoretical transformation is in changing the way we model social life. And that's what I'd like to uh, explore with you for the next few minutes. For the past century, We've had three primary tools in social science, uh, ethnographies, lab experiments, and surveys. And they each have complementary advantages. Uh, ethnographies allow us to um, uh, examine relational data, interactions between people. Lab studies allow us to use randomized trials to tease out causal processes. And surveys have large representative samples that allow us to generalize 
to an underlying population. But they also have disadvantages. Uh, ethnographies have small n, they're very hard to replicate. Uh, lab experiments uh, typically rely on you know, a handful of college sophomores taking in. Hard to generalize sometimes to the larger population. And while surveys have been right with uh, uh, transforming social science into a modern scientific discipline, at the same time, there are also really important limitations. Um, surveys are, um, they rely on retrospective reflections and reports from the respondents. And these are to memory losses, to self-censorship, um, and longitudinal designs are really expensive, uh, very hard to get fine-grained temporal uh, measurements. And surveys are also susceptible to selection bias uh, due to the reluctance of stigmatized populations and the very rich and the very poor to, um, to participate in surveys. And surveys typically, they measure what the investigator thinks is important, not what the respondents may think is important. And then finally, there's the problem of street lamp bias. So what is street lamp bias? Um, street lamp bias is the tendency to look where the light is pointing, uh, not where the answer lies. So in this cartoon, uh, we look for our quarter that we dropped under the light, not two blocks away. So where do surveys point the light? Well, the answer requires that we think about how samples differ and differ deliberately, differ by design, from the underlying population that they're intended to represent. Well, there's one obvious deliberate difference, uh, and that's size. Uh, they're, they're supposed to be smaller. That's kind of the point. But that's not the only way that they differ deliberately. Anybody want to suggest something else? Deliberate difference between the sample and the underlying population? Yes, amen. The, the what? The main thing that's different is that you might come, you might just have many other. And you're using that to study females? You may be a Okay, good one. That's a good one. Well, though, yes, uh huh? And why did you do that deliberately? Why do we want that to happen? This is, I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning the things that we, we want to have differ from the underlying population, not the things that differ and we wish it were not the case. Yes. Bingo. Very good. That's exactly it. The respondents in the survey have no friends in, in the sample. They have no family, and their coworkers are not there, their roommates, their colleagues, and yet they're there in the underlying population. And this is, in fact, necessary. It's essential to have independent observations, as you just pointed out, uh, in order to be able to um, uh, have a representative sample. So we need to do this. But it does have <coughs> an atomistic street lamp bias. So who is your screen up here? This microphone. Interfering. Okay. And use this one. Okay. Great. So I hope you've been hearing some of this up until this. <laughs> yeah? Good. So let's do an illustration. Uh, consider the problem of opinion formation. Um, so here we have the classic model from the sociologist Max Weber, class, status, and party. And it's a theory about how political preferences are shaped by personal experiences and material interests. Um, but importantly, the experiences and the interests are not just anyone's, they're, they're mine. They're the, they're the experiences and the interests of that respondent whose opinions that we're uh, attempting to predict. And, and, and we, we're examining that in isolation 
from the people around that respondent. Uh, so we adopt this atomistic model of where these opinions come from because we have marvelous data on people's demographics and social class. And we have no data, in, mo in many cases, on their friends and family and coworkers and the social influences around them. So we look for the answer where the light is pointing. And the light is pointing within the individual, not between. So this atomistic explanation actually makes a lot of sense. For one thing, it resonates with this enlightenment idea that we think for ourselves. We're not influenced by our neighbors. We figure it out on our own. But also, I mean, it, it does make sense that, you know, going to college and getting married and having kids is going to shape a lot of what you think about everything from, you know, climate change to, to um, uh, traffic and, uh, uh, and, and other issues. And, and your income is going to affect your views on, on tax reform. So it makes sense that personal experiences and, and material interests are going to influence how we think. But it's not the whole story. Uh, there's also the between individual mechanisms in opinion formation. Uh, so for example, the self-reinforcing dynamics by which we're more likely to interact with people to the extent that they're similar, and then the, uh, uh, the more similar we are, the more likely we are to interact a self-reinforcing dynamic of homophily and influence that can shape uh, patterns of opinion formation and the clustering of opinion within a population. And so we call this a relational explanation, not an, a, a, in contrast to an atomistic, between individual in contrast to within. Relational analysis generally has three levels. There are the individual nodes. There are the connections between the nodes. And there's the structure of those connections. Now, the attributes of the nodes, we can learn from surveys. But survey data is not very well suited to learning about the, uh, the relations or the network structures, things like the strength, the sign, the direction, uh, the embeddedness of social ties, or the clustering of the social network. So the punchline, the big breakthrough with online data is not that it's big, it's that the data are relational. We finally have network data at population scale. Nevertheless, digital data from online sources, it shares with survey data a really important limitation. With a few exceptions, uh, these data are mostly observational. And so the big breakthrough is not likely to be in the area of explanation, um, we may have to be patient, at least for now, uh, and settle for breakthroughs in measurement. But that's still incredibly exciting um, because these, the ability to measure things that we could never measure before means that we can test theories we could never test before. Uh, for example, uh, we, can, we can measure contagion and its spread, um, including contagions that, that die out and fail to spread. We can, we can measure emotions in real time. We can find extremists and hate speakers who might not want to respond to a survey. We can study social movement mobilization from the very beginning before the movement is large enough to attract the attention of researchers and, the, and to then be documented. Um, and we can measure cultural alignments, not just through opinions, but as expressed in behavior. And so here are some of the uh, measurement projects that are currently underway uh, at Cornell or that we've uh, completed in the lab. Uh, and they illustrate how we can test theories that we could not test before. And these range from you know, circadian rhythms uh, to culture wars, the polarization of science, wormholes, uh, measuring demography and uh, class characteristics online, uh, tracking the spread of hate speech, and detecting fake news. But I'm going to focus on the first four of these today, beginning with circadian rhythms. Uh, you can think of it sort of as uh, mood swings. And mood is important. Uh, it's, it's important not only for memory, but also creativity, and even immune response. 
Uh, and it's known to be affected by neurochemicals and by patterns of work and sleep. But the change in mood from hour to hour is really difficult to track by asking people to report their mood uh, periodically with, with a test instrument. And so we tried a different approach. We tracked mood on Twitter. And the way we did it was to count the proportion of words in people's uh, messages that appear in lists of affect words that were compiled by Jamie Pennebaker and his team uh, and independently validated and have actually been widely used in many studies uh, for, quite some, uh, for quite some time. And so here's some examples of words in the positive affect lexicon and, here's some, and some words in the negative. And notice that these two dimensions are, they're, 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 they're not opposites. In fact, they're not even correlated. So you can actually be high on both positive and negative affect, what psychologists call high arousal, or you can be low on both. And here are our main results, and you'll see that, um, yeah, we're, we're happiest in the morning around breakfast time, and then it's all downhill. <laughs> And you know, when people, when we first looked at this, and when people look at it, they first they say, "Oh, well, it's work." Uh, you know, the stresses of work, the boss is giving you a hard time. But then you notice that it's not work. It's it's actually even more prominent on the weekend, but it's delayed uh, by about 90 minutes on the weekend. And and you know, I think what this shows is that um, Twitter users don't have kids. <laughs> We find this pattern all over the world, not just in, in the West, uh, but also a very similar pattern in Africa um, and Asia. And we can extend this tool to study not just emotions, but also behaviors, what people do all day. So for instance, uh, we, uh, we have bacon on weekends, and we, we, have bacon, we like bacon better than sausage. And we pray in the morning especially on Sunday. But Sunday's not just for praying. Um, and uh, staff meeting, uh, so Wayne, staff meeting is Tuesday at 9 o'clock. And you know why it's not on Monday morning, right? So happy hour, right when you would expect, four to five, except on Friday when it starts after lunch and runs through dinner. <laughs> so the conclusion from all this, these digital traces from social media provide very detailed time-stamped indicators of what people are thinking and doing at a very granular level and yet on a global scale. It's really pretty remarkable. The next study, remember this guy? Uh, the next study I'd like to share with you is on lifestyle politics. Um, the latte liberal idea, which seems to have originated actually in an attack ad that went viral on YouTube. Let's take a look. So did this attack ad, oops. So did this attack ad go too far? Uh, well, let's ask Stephen Colbert. <laughs> I have to turn the audio on and off. That's the tricky part here. All right.
latte liberals. So liberals hate America, but they love anything foreign. Lattes, Volvos, Beethoven. <laughs> right? You see the pattern. So we actually think maybe Colbert's wrong about this. We, we have a different explanation. Uh, we call it the theory of identity chambers. So you know about echo chambers. That refers to this idea that we're all in these silos where we're only hearing the viewpoints we agree with. We don't hear other points of view. Identity chamber, the idea is it's not just about what you hear. It's also about the badges that you wear. The ideas being sort of bumper stickers that, uh, that, that signal your membership in an in-group, and maybe just as importantly, uh, they signal that you're not in the out-group. Um, so the question then is, are, are latte-drinking liberals a caricature from the Club for Growth, or are they evidence of a red-blue divide, not just on politics, but on what hot beverage to drink? And so to find out, we analyzed the political co-follower network on Twitter. We started with 553 current and recent members of Congress who are active on Twitter and whose political alignments have already been measured uh, using their roll call voting. So we then identified 5 million followers of those Congress members whose political alignment can then be imputed by who they chose to follow uh, in Congress. And then we look to see what lifestyle accounts these 5 million people also follow. But before we can turn this method loose, we need to make sure it works. So we need a sanity check. And our sanity check will start with, we need, a, we need a ground truth. We need somebody where we know the answer. So we take the Congress people. We take them one at a time. And we pretend we don't know their roll call voting. And then we impute it from the co-follower network and then compare to see how well our imputation matches their original roll call voting uh, uh, political alignment. And as you can see, we do pretty darn well. Uh, we've got Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders on the far left and Ted Cruz bringing up the far right. And we also tested it with other sources of ground truth. We did self-identified political pundits whose, whose ideology is known, Michael Moore and, um, and uh, uh, Ralph, and musicians who endorse candidates, uh, Bruce Springsteen and Ted Nugent, <laughs> and lots of others uh, that have endorsed uh, uh, Democrats and Republicans. We did restaurants whose customers have been surveyed for their political opinions. And we, we do pretty well. Here are the correlations, uh, near perfect on Congress members and, and pundits. Uh, not quite as strong for artists and fast food as you might expect, but still uh, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty strong. Uh, so the method seems to work. And so now we feel like, OK, let's turn this loose on some things that we don't know the correct answer and see what we find. So here's music. This, are, uh, uh, these are the, uh, this is the co-follower network of the Billboard 100 artists. Um, and uh, their location in the network is based on the co-following with other artists. But their color, red to blue, is based on co-following with Congress. And the interesting thing that you see here is that these artists are as much, they're, they're clustered as much by politics as by musical genre. There's a very strong political clustering. I think Madonna was the most left wing of that group. And then if we break it down into other genres, we see that, uh, that conservatives like country, western, and religious music, and that's about it. <laughs> so now this, we can play a little game here. Um, so we can use this method to score cars with the weighted average of the voting record of the co-followed Congress members. So let's start with vehicles. So what's the vehicle most followed by liberals? Wow, you folks are good. 
All right, let's see if you can go two for two. The vehicle most followed by conservatives. <laughs> Not just the Harley Davidson, but the hog. All right, the TV show most followed by liberals. <laughs> Big Bang Theory actually is the second most followed by conservatives because I hate to tell you this, but it's a, it, they, they see it as a satire. On them. Okay. Uh, the, show, the, the show most followed by liberals. Uh, a Cornell alum, I might point out. The show most followed by conservatives. And you know, you know the second most, Big Bang Theory. Number one, though, most followed by conservatives. Somebody said Fox News. I think, is that spelled F-A-U-X? <laughs> so it's, a, it's a show about how white men, it's okay for white men to shoot people they don't consider fully human. Okay, the sport most followed by conservatives. This is easy. And the show, uh, the sport, sorry, the sport most followed by conservatives? Football. It's just, it's football. It's the same one, except there's no tackling. It's a... <laughs> okay, so we also have a website uh, where you can go. It's a work in progress. We have not fully integrated all the data yet. Uh, and so we're sort of building it up as we go. Um, and let's see if we can get there. Here we go. Here's our website. And we can, we can, first we can explore various categories. So now here we're going, we did vehicles before. Now we're going to do automobile brands. It's not the same. And Tesla, there on the left. And Howdy David is still on, still on the right. Oh, sorry. It's on my screen, but not on yours. I think... <laughs> I think uh, I think we're not going to see our our um, website, but that's all right. So it's lifestyle politics. Uh, you're welcome to go visit it and explore. And in addition to exploring various categories, um, you can also um, you can put in your own Twitter account, and you can and, and we will analyze on the fly. We will analyze your account, and we will find out. Do liberals or conservatives tend to follow the people you follow? You may be surprised and probably won't be. So uh, we also have a related study. Um, we use a similar method to study the political polarization of science. Now, when I was in college, it was the left who was skeptical about science. But that flipped over in, in the Reagan years, uh, probably because of conservative concerns about uh, climate change, uh, evolution, cosmology. And also, among scientists, Democrats outnumber Republicans by about 10 to 1. So it flipped over in the 1980s. And, um, and so the question that motivated our study, even if lifestyles cannot bridge the political divide, surely science can, can bring us together. Surely that, that can be a bridge. So there are three ways that science could be a bridge. One is science could just be politically irrelevant, right? So uh, science readers just don't read political books. Or science could be politically unaligned. So liberals and conservatives are equally interested in, in science. Or science could be non-polarized, uh, that liberals and conservatives read exactly the same books on science. So these are questions that we wanted to answer. And to find out, we analyzed millions of book sales on Amazon and on Barnes and Noble. We did the analysis with Amazon, and then we replicated it with Barnes and Noble and got exactly the same results. Uh, so we analyzed about 1.3 million books, uh, about 
half a million on science. We had 3,500 political books, uh, and we had 17 million co-purchase ties between political books and science books. So here's an example of how a co-purchase tie is formed. So this is a book by a climatologist, uh, Tim Ball, PhD, uh, wrote a book, on, wrote several books actually, on, on climate science. And if you scroll down on the Amazon page, you see this, customers who, who bought this item also bought. And you see there are two books there on climatology and two that are just on, on politics. So the method that we used is similar to how we measured political alignment of lifestyles, but instead of co-following liberal and conservative Congress members, we're looking at the co-purchasing of uh, liberal and conservative books. So we, we start with a hand-coded list of, sort of red and blue books, and we then look at all the books that are co-purchased with these political books, and then we identify which of the co-purchased books are science books, is the book linked to more red or blue books, uh, than would be expected by chance given the popularity of the book. So we hand-coded uh, 677 conservative books, 587 liberal, using two independent coders with a tiebreaker when, when needed. And here's some examples of the liberal books. Here are the conservative. And this is, again, a sanity check. This is the co-follower network just of the political books, no science books yet. And, and this shows what we would expect. Um, people who buy a liberal book don't buy conservative books. People who buy conservative books don't buy liberal books. But there are some exceptions. And those exceptions turn out to be really interesting. The red orphans, these reds that are in the blue patch, those are books by moderate Republicans critical of the religious right. Within, within the party. And the blue orphans in the red cluster are books by progressive community organizers like Saul Alinsky, uh, who was, uh, you know, they were discovered by the Tea Party. So here's our overall big result. And you see that science books are more likely actually to be co-purchased with red books, with conservative books. But the conservative books tend to the conservatives tend to purchase books in a in a narrow bandwidth, a narrow genre of science that appeals to conservatives, while the liberals are more dispersed. They tend to buy uh, books and to read books that are more broadly dispersed across the sciences. And in this graph, we break this down a little further into three measures: relevance, polarization, and alignment. Uh, color indicates alignment from red to blue. Um, and we also report relevance, which is the just how much there's co-purchasing with political books, and polarization, which is if, if you co-purchased a red, would that book also be co-purchased with a blue? In other words, do the liberals and conservatives read the same books? And we find that science books are more politically relevant, more conservatively aligned, and more polarized than non-science, due largely to the social sciences and humanities, uh, while the physical and life sciences are more similar to books in non-science. And then when we drill down into specific disciplines, we see this very dramatic polarization of science. The conservatives and liberals do not read the same books. Uh, and the books that appeal to conservatives are not all that appealing to the general audience uh, for the discipline, with the possible exception of economics, where it's about equal. But in all the other cases, you see how the red clusters are more on the periphery of the co-follower networks. And a really interesting finding, which is certainly relevant giving a talk here uh, at, at RTI, the difference between applied and basic science. Applied disciplines like medicine, law, and, and climatology are relatively conservative in uh, co-purchasing while basic science disciplines like zoology, anthropology, and philosophy are relatively liberal. And this association is even stronger if we drill down even deeper into sub-disciplines. Uh, you see that in the scatter plot where uh, the conservative alignment tends to increase with our index of applied science, which, is, which measures the ratio of patent to article citations. 
So we conclude that the political left and right share an interest in science in general, but not science in particular. And the last study is about our discovery of wormholes in really large social networks uh, at the scale of an entire country. Um, and these had never been seen before because we've never seen networks at the scale of an entire country. By wormholes, we mean high bandwidth shortcuts that span extreme network distances. So analogy to, to wormholes in, in physical space. We discovered these wormholes in the course of testing a key hypothesis in one of the most widely cited papers in all of social science, The Strength of Weak Ties by Mark Granovetter, cited more than the wealth of nations. And, uh, and there's a key assumption in the theory that's never been tested because we did not have the necessary data. And that assumption is that bridge ties are weak. So Granovetter starts with a really game-changing insight, really had an enormous impact on, on social science in general, network science in particular. And it's the idea that social ties vary in strength as measured by frequency of interaction, by trust, by emotional investment in the relationship. And his, his insight was that these ties can nevertheless be structurally strong even though they're relationally weak. Structurally strong in that they are much more likely to connect us to people who are uh, outside our small circle of friends. So for example, we're more likely to hear about a job from an acquaintance than we are from our best friend for you know, the simple reason that our best friend talks to the same people we do. And so it's more likely to be redundant. And so the key point then is that the strength of weak ties is that they bridge between clusters. So Granovetter has two measures of network bridges. One is called embeddedness, and this is the number of common neighbors. So you can think of this as the width of the bridge. Uh, so for example, the tie between A and C has, you can think of it as having three lanes. So there's the direct lane from A to C, but then there are two indirect lanes uh, through, uh, through D and E. Range is the distance spanned by the tie, and the range of the tie from A to B, in this case, is 13, because if the bridge from A to B is closed for repairs, you've got to go 13 steps to get around to the other side of the river. So that's the range. We've had lots of studies that measured embeddedness, because you can do that with a small network. No studies to measure range, because we have not had the really expansive network data with which to, to measure it. But here's the core prediction. The prediction we're testing is that the strength decreases with network distance. So that means the strength increases with embeddedness and decreases with range. We tested this idea with two data sets. We collected 158 million Twitter users in eight countries. And we also used British telecom call logs um, for 51 million phones in the UK. We measure a tie as um, an at mention on Twitter or a call on BT where there's a call or an at mention in each direction. It has to be reciprocated at least once. And we measure the strength of the tie by the frequency of interaction uh, and by the emotional investment. So here's the prediction again. What are we looking for? We're looking for the strength to go downward from upper left to lower right. And what do we find? That's exactly what we find for embeddedness. As expected, the communication frequency for Twitter uh, the, is lower for the uh, less embedded ties, exactly as, as Granovetter predicts. And in fact, we already knew this, because there have been other studies that have shown this using much smaller networks, but they get this same result. Um, but now let's turn to the one that hasn't been measured before, the range of the ties. 
And sure enough, we get Granovetter's result, at least as we go from the shortest possible range, two is the theoretical minimum because they have a shared neighbor. They have one or more shared neighbors. Three, there's no shared neighbors. And as we go from range two to range three, the strength declines. But let's keep going. What happens if we go beyond range three? The strength comes back up. And in fact, as we get to really long range ties, they're almost as strong as the embedded ties. And those are the wormholes. They're very rare, but surprisingly strong. We also measured the affective strength of the ties. The what I just showed you was frequency of interaction, but what's the emotional content? And we used that same lexicon to process the, the tweets on these ties. And here again, we find the same thing. As the range increases, the affective content of the messages goes up. And then we also measured this with, with uh, BT phone call logs. And here again, as we go from range two to longer range ties, we're getting Granovetter's result. The strength is declining. But then there's a turnaround. And as we get to really long range ties, the strength goes back up. Almost identical pattern to what we find on, on Twitter. And so this, is, this has come to be known as the small world effect. And what we're finding is that long range ties, they're extremely rare, but they're surprisingly strong. And we tested, it's not, it's not due to instrumental relationships. It's not because it's you know, the plumber or the interior decorator or someone that nobody else that you know talks to, but you need to talk to them a lot. Um, and it's not spatial distance. Um, what we, uh, we think the best case is that, that these long range bridge ties decay much faster than short range ties. And so the ones that are left are the strong ones. Whereas for the short range tie, you've got the full gamut. And that, that's why we think we're seeing this, this, uh, this effect. Uh, but the important consequence is that they provide these high bandwidth conduits for information uh, and for contagions to, to quickly spread across very large network distances. So I hope these studies will give you an idea about some of the really amazing research opportunities that are opened up by these new sources of, of online data, uh, where we can study human behavior and social interaction in ways that would not have seemed possible uh, even a short time ago. Um, we can have real-time measures of emotions. We can have behavioral measures of cultural fault lines. Uh, and wormholes in national networks. But there are also some enormous challenges that we face. Uh, and some of these are well known. Uh, the privacy concerns <coughs> that limit data access and data sharing, making it hard to replicate the studies. Um, and there's also the issue of whether we can really generalize from the online to the offline world. There's the problem of the representativeness of people in social media. And those have been widely discussed and talked about at great length by both by the research community and also by outside commentators. But less attention has been directed to another challenge that I would like to call your attention to. And that is that there are very limited sociodemographic measures in, in much of the online data. And the warning from this is that social scientists are simply not going to rush to use data that has no independent variables. And lots of dependent variables. But how do social scientists explain things? Age, race, gender, ethnicity, education, income, all the things that are missing in these data. And until that's filled in and we have those data, I really don't see these data being all that useful across the social sciences. I don't see it replacing reliance on the three standard methods that we've used for the past 100 years. But the solution that I propose is to integrate online data with surveys. And it's interesting how complementary these two sources of data really are. They have complementary strengths and weaknesses. Survey data, strong on demographics, while Online data are weak. But survey data are weak on peer relations, where online data are strong. 
As survey data use representative samples, which online data do not have, and surveys are weak on behavioral measures, which are a core strength of the online data. So they're very complementary, and I will leave you with the thought that the integration of survey data and digital data is the future of social science, along with opportunities for online experiments, which is a topic for another day. So I'll end there. have a couple of minutes for questions. Yes. Yes. Hi, thank you for that very interesting talk. Um, I had a question around sort of an additional challenge that I've thought about in terms of studying um, social dynamics and relationships using online data. Do you have any sense or have there been any experiments to see whether online relationships behave in the same way that in-person, in IRL relationships do? That's an excellent question. It's a really important question. In fact, people often say, you know, it's a sort of ritual. That's a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's very hard to, to be able to measure that. I, I think that uh, the, 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 you know, the bad news, it's really hard to do this. The good news is that increasingly, the online relationships are just as important to understand in and of themselves, but trying to map them onto what happens in the offline world is, is not always going to be straightforward. Nevertheless, uh, the, the mood swings that we're uh, documenting, uh, that's really happening in people's lives. Uh, that's not just because they're, they're on Twitter. Uh, they have to be on Twitter for us to, to pick it up, but... Uh, that's really happening in, in the world. But when we look at things like the, the, the friendships and what happens in a friendship, uh, the nature of reciprocity and trust and cooperation, just even the norms about how it's okay to talk to people, very different in, 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 the, um, in the online and the offline world. Um, so we have to be really careful about generalizing. Sometimes we can do it pretty safely. And other times, we, sh we need to be aware that we're really studying an offline phenomenon. I, I think that in the, the studies that I presented today, I'm pretty confident that what we're picking up with the code following is really in the offline world. Uh, and I think we, we see that, um, and certainly I think we see that in the, in the call logs and in the Twitter logs that we use to measure uh, uh, wormholes. But if we're looking at things like what is the nature of a relationship, which which is an extremely important topic. Um, I think all bets are off when we try to generalize. Yes, in the back. Yeah, I'm kind of curious about with um, the, the, the digital projection of life that there's this kind of interesting recursive pattern where, you know, so for example, on Twitter and LinkedIn, those services are suggesting to me people I should follow. So kind of the network science is being applied by the service, which then actually modifies my behavior in ways that you wouldn't normally um, be able to predict. So I'm wondering if you're concerned a little bit about how you've got this issue of you're kind of measuring a, a moving landscape because the, the nature of the platform itself is changing and this application of network science is changing the way, what, what, you're, actually, what you're able to observe, basically. Yeah, another great question. And by the way, that's a question that's, a, that's really a very pointed question about our study of Amazon. Think about it, right? We're using Amazon's collaborative filtering algorithm, which is recommending books, to study the, the, the co-purchasing. But the co-purchasing is being motivated in part by seeing the recommendations, right? So this is exactly what you're, what you're pointing to. And it really strikes home right there. You were very polite and kind not to point out, out this <laughs> obvious <laughs> application of the art. But we actually, you know, we 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 thought about that a lot, and 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 we, we do talk. There's a paper that's coming out in, in Nature Human Behavior that, uh, and and we do we address exactly that that problem. Um, we think that that in fact there is that uh, very likely self-reinforcing dynamic that's that's operating here, but it's nevertheless real. It's still happening. Um, people still have to choose: 
across a lot of books that are being recommended that are all over the place to pick the, the ones that we're picking, that we're recording in the data. But in, in general, I would say also when, when, we, when we're thinking about our theory of identity chambers, the, the, the collaborative filtering algorithms on Facebook and other social media sites are certainly contributing to that, um, along with just the selection effects of, of individuals choosing where to go. One of, to me, one of the great paradoxes of the online world is that the, going online makes it really easy for us to reach out to people really different from ourselves. Uh, and it, and it, it could open up remarkable opportunities for people to experience genuine diversity uh, and to increase our tolerance of people who have different lifestyles. Doesn't seem to be working. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh-huh. So I'm not a social scientist, so it may not be a good question, but nevertheless. Um, not a social scientist, but in my, it may not be good. You showed di diurnality in certain behaviors, okay, uh, staff meetings and so forth. But if, is there, if there's diurnality in Twitter use, then would that not skew the, what you get out of it? You're not a social scientist. And by the way, some of my social scientist friends say the same thing about me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you, you, this, in fact, this is such an important point. So when we first submitted the paper, Sci we, we published this paper in Science. When we first submitted it, Science rejected the paper. And the main reason they, they rejected it was that there was another paper that we cited that had already studied this result. But then we pointed out to them just this point that you raised, which was true of their paper, but we had corrected for it. And that's how we got it into Science. And they, they thought, that's really cool, because Barbara Jazz, who was the editor, she was. She hadn't. No, she hadn't realized that 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 could be a problem. I mean, you picked it up, but she didn't. She, she's from chemistry, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and so you know. Of course, she, I'm an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, but she realized that's a really important point, and and we were correcting for that, uh, whereas the other study hadn't. Um, and so you know, it, it is very. It, it's it's really crucial, and you you always have to do that. You have to separate out these baseline effects from the thing that we're trying to measure. For instance, in the Amazon study, we use a, a Bayesian method where we randomize the co-follower graph to get a baseline of what we would expect to find, and then we measure the, the lift from knowing the, uh, the identities of the books, um, which is, again, doing the same thing. It's trying to correct for things like the popularity of the book, which is going to produce co-purchasing. <coughs> yes? Uh -huh. I'm wondering whether the... Uh, the wormhole effect can be manipulated or generalized or distributed so as to provide some immunization to some sort of cross-pollination on the side to sort of democratize or liberalize these men. One would think. Uh... It, it should be getting us, and, and actually, uh, it's, it's interesting you raise this because Georgia and I were having a conversation about this earlier today, and Georgia had a really interesting theory about these wormholes, which I'll, I'll if it's okay with you, I will, I will, uh, I will announce to the group. So the theory is that homophily is pretty gen generic. Uh, we just like to interact with people who are similar to ourselves, but there's also uh, xenophilia. But xenophilia is much more selective, so that when we reach out, when we want to connect to someone who's different, we don't. We still want to have some similarity. So if you know, if you're a, 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 a Hillary supporter and you have a Trump friend, it's likely that although you disagree on politics, you must have a lot of other things in common, so you can actually talk to each other in a civil way, right? And and have a conversation. And so the idea is then that. That since you're most, since these people are on the other side, if you will, um, you're, you're not going to have short-range paths between you because you're not going to have shared friends. Um, but but you may have a strong relationship because it's important to you to have this person who's very different. And I think that's that's the hope that your question is pointing to. And it's an interesting explanation. I think it's probably not the right one, but <laughs> but I, I I wish it were. 
I wish that were in fact what, what's going on. Yes? Uh, following in that line, mm -hmm. Between the two, you know, for the for the long for the strong weak tie. <laughs> uh, just wondering if there might be some network social capital effects, and that might be the advantage between uh, the two. You know, maintaining that tie, like for someone who is within the same industry, but it's so it's an important uh, connection because of their amount of uh, ties that they can diffuse information. Right. Yeah. In fact, uh, one of the most important forms of social capital is just popularity and degree. And that was one of the very first things we checked because that's an obvious explanation that if, you know, if, you, if you're really popular and you have lots of friends, you're not going to be able to spend as much time on each one. You've, got to, you've only got so many hours in the day. And so you're going to have weaker relationships with more people and you're going to have shorter range ties because think about it, you've got more opportunities to have people in common because you've got more higher degrees. That was the very first thing we, we checked. Nope. And, and in fact, it turned out, believe it or not, the effect was actually, so the, what, I, what I presented to you today was correcting for that, right? Because if you don't correct for that, you're, you know, you're sort of an idiot. I mean, it's such an obvious explanation. You've you got to correct. So that was, a, you know, we corrected for that. And when we correct for it, the result is actually a little bit stronger. So that's not even a small part of it. it it's, it's really in spite of this effect of, of social capital, if you will. Uh, but with these data, it's really hard for us to track down a lot of information, uh, especially about things like industry and occupation. Uh, that's one of the, the most important limitations of this entire enterprise, that we don't have those data. Uh, and that really limits our ability to explain. And, th and that's why I'm really trying to stress and to try to sell to people the idea that, you know, measurement is okay. I would think RTI is a place where you, you do understand that measurement is actually a pretty good thing. Um, my friends in sociology poo-poo measurement and say, oh, you, you have to explain. Look, the first step is to measure. And, and, if we, and we can test a lot of theories just by being able to measure things we could have measured before. So the, some of the things that you're asking about you know, future research, uh, and and hopefully we'll we'll track it down. Uh, let's have one more question. Great. Uh -huh. Yes. I have a question about your conclusion with um, this: how surveys are the future of um, twi mm -hmm. Twitter data, mm -hmm. or one of many conclusions. But um, what I, I was wondering when we're thinking about digital footprints, I feel like. I'm leaving my di digital footprint everywhere, and my demographic data is all over the internet. And I know that getting something in a single data set is different, but when you're talking about occupation, my Twitter is linked to my LinkedIn, which has exactly what I do at RTI on it. And all of these things are, are connect, which is connected to my Facebook. And I, I know data access is an issue, but I'm interested to hear um, what ways that you've tried to address the socio-demographic data issue Yes, thus thank far. you. Thank you for asking that question because we're working really hard on this. Um, we, we have a, a grant from, from, uh, from, from the National Science Foundation to, uh, to work on this because they, they also recognize that these, we have to do this. So, um, uh, so we're using things like um, uh, image processing and, and face recognition which works pretty well for age, uh, for gender. Uh, for, when I first came across this, this method of processing, so we take profile photos and process the first <coughs> profile photos with a service called Face++. You can try it out. I sent my, my uh, I, I grabbed one of my photos with myself, sent it off to Face++. It came back, I was all excited. I was sick, it said I was six years younger. <laughs> At my age, that, that, that's important. <laughs> and, and then the, the, suddenly I realized uh, the picture was six years old. <laughs> <laughs> so they nailed it. Um, it. It doesn't work as well for, um, for uh, it worked well for race, doesn't work well for ethnicity. But for ethnicity, names work well, where people put their name. Uh, 
uh, you can you can do Hispanic and Asian uh, ethnicity from names. So uh, we're also uh, working on on income and education. So education, we do uh, we use uh, SAT word lists and uh, to to estimate their their education. I mean, we're not going to get it down to hey, you're going to graduate in May instead of June, <laughs> but but we can get you know in broad strokes, we can get people's uh, uh, educational attainment. Uh, we're doing uh, income or something sort of equivalent. Uh, we get we take Twitter users who turn on location services. We get their GPS point cloud, which will usually have 10 or 20 locations in it where they move around. We figure out which one is home, starting with nights and weekends, but we have a few other tricks to figure out which one is their home. We, re we run the, the, the uh, GPS coordinates through Google's uh, address finder, running it backwards to get their street address, and then we look up their street address on Zillow, <laughs> and we get their home value. Wow. And uh, so, you know, we can. There are things that can be done, uh, and I think this is this is where we need to go. <laughs> uh, thank you.